Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. I'm honored today to have in the studio the former CEO of probably one of the most innovative products to come out in the last wee while, I think, in New Zealand, uh, the Manta 5. I'd like to welcome Greg Johnson. How are you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. No worries. So I want to know, um, in regards to the Manta 5 stuff, how did this eventuate into this massive global behemoth? Because from what I understand, you guys were a small, small company to start with. That's right. And yeah. then it just grew and grew. Yeah, so it's the brainchild of of Guy Howard Willis. So he's yep. the founder of Torpedo 7. And um, when they were transitioning out of Torpedo 7 selling to Warehouse, he kind of got dreaming again. Yep. And um, he literally had a dream one night of um, pushing off from his pontoon in Pawanui, where his holiday home is. And he remembered the dream as if he was riding on water and he went out into the estuary and these dolphins came up next to him. And it was this whole profound dream that he was like, how can I create you know, the same experience, which I love on the road, but now on water? Yep. And he had a bit of money and, and obviously time up his, his sleeve. So he was like, well, why not give it a go? And so that was, what, eight years ago now. And so he just found an engineer who was a, a bike designer, Roland Alonso, and he was just like, do you want to give it a crack? And so for the first two and a half years, that has kept it secret. He didn't really tell anybody. The only people who knew were his, his wife and Roland's wife. Um, didn't even tell his son who he invested in everything together yeah. with um, because he didn't want to be told no. And then... Um, yeah, I joined the team like just over four years ago when it was just two engineers and this crazy idea um, with a few prototypes lying around. Um, and then we just went through basically taking it from that prototype to really understanding who would even want one of these and what would it, what would they be looking for uh, with the product. So yeah, going from there to where we've got to has been a pretty cool journey. Did you did you approach him or did he approach you in terms of you getting involved? Yeah, oh, there's a bit of backstory to it. So I actually worked for another company that he um, was a major investor in called Startup Factory. Yep. And it was pretty much just taking business ideas and seeing if they were good ideas or not. So really just... Um, you know, taking an idea, get it, putting a bit of money behind it and validating if it was all good or not. Um, and then if we were to invest, what would it require? And so I worked for him and that team for a couple of years. And then he just um, shoulder tapped me and said, I've got this crazy idea. Do you want to come check it out? And I wa ro ro <laughs> rocked into this um, this little workshop in Cambridge, this, um, you know, dark and dingy little workshop with two engineers. And I was like, what is going on here? Yeah. Um, but just saw opportunity in his vision to be able to really um, replicate cycling on water and was like, you know, why not? So, so did it stay the way it was originally envisioned or is it obviously changed? Because I know with technology, you know, you st start with like a rough blueprint, I'd say, and then it evolves over time, I suppose, particularly when you've got a group and you're bouncing ideas up each other. Yeah, more or less the concept that guy wanted to create was replicating the true cycling experience. So when you see pontoons or, you know, those big boats that have, um, you know, you pedal, he didn't want anything like that. So his original idea or concept was to use hydrofoils, which is very much like a wing of an airplane. Mm. And as you create forward momentum, you get lift. So he wanted um, two foils and a propeller. And so that was kind of the the main starting point. The major change, I guess, to be able to bring it to life was to make it electric because you could ride it. We had it pure manual and we could ride it for sort of two or three minutes until you were exhausted. And so we then went back to the drawing board and said, well, how could we create something that someone could use for say 10 or 15 minutes? And that's when we integrated an electric motor. And obviously that puts a whole bunch more tech in it because um, you know, batteries and salt water is an explosion. So, um, <laughs> so there's a lot of tech that's gone in behind making it the yep. world's first waterproof electric bike. Um, yeah. So, because I, I imagine a lot of the technology you would have had to create yourself. Every, everything. Everything. That's, yeah, pretty much everything, man. Like the one thing that um, people don't realize, I see it as a bike, but um, most bike companies they design a frame and they go to a bike show and they get the suspension and the wheels and all that from other companies and they can kit set and make a bike. Whereas for us, we don't have any wheels, we don't have any standardized products, so everything pretty much is built in house or customized quite severely to be able to get it to work. So, so what what was the hardest part of designing it? Um, well, the, the first challenge was really around making the hydrodynamics work. So getting enough thrust from a little propeller that you could actually pedal yourself yeah. um, and getting the, the actual foils in the right 
um, the, the right size and in the right position relative to the rider. Mm. So that took quite a bit of time, but then actually commercializing it, taking it from just a prototype to actually being able to manufacture it, that was a other major challenge. And then waterproofing all your technology. So all the battery and motor has to be completely um, IP67 waterproof, which is ridiculously hard. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are sort of the main challenges. Were you, were you testing it what, at Lake Carapira? Is that where you're testing it? Yeah. So yeah. for the, like before they got any patents or trademarks or anything around it, they tried to keep it in secret. <clears throat> so um, they did a lot of pull tests over in Tauranga and at um, Waterworld here in Tarapa. Oh, yes. Um, and then once we sort of got some protection around it, we started in Kar Karapiro and um, all over Hamilton, took it up to Auckland and had a go on the surf and, and Raglan, which didn't go too well on the first time. But... Oh, oh, because of the surf, I suppose, <laughs> yeah. the waves. That's it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can it actually, how, how well does it deal with waves? Yeah, so that whole front section that you see, if you've seen the videos and yeah, stuff, yeah. It, it pivots all the time. So right. that allows it to cut through chop and go up and over waves. Um, but yeah, you have to be pretty experienced to be wanting to ride and, and chop because um, it just makes it a little bit more challenging. So people who start usually start on like a, a nice calm lake yeah, yeah yeah but how how big of the waves can it take before it oh. more than like it would get damaged yeah you know? Well, like, we, could it handle like piha type waves? Oh no, nah, yeah, put, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nah, nah. We, we um we went to GoPro Summit in Broome in yeah, Australia, I saw that. and um there was some gnarly as waves. So we didn't really put too many of the GoPro guys there on it. But um yeah, we, if you're hitting a wave directly on it, like heading out to um off the shore, then you can take a wave sort of um, four or five foot high. Yeah, but it is pretty gnarly. Um, yeah. and then on the way back, if you're hitting a wave sideways or whatever, it it doesn't necessarily because the, the rear foil is quite long um, so it kind of gets a bit unstable but um, the team at Manta 5 they'll be they'll be developing one for the surf in the future like guys pretty keen to have a, a surf model yeah because I was going to ask I suppose that's you currently have the first model that's it and I'd imagine there'd be other ideas for other models later on down the line yeah that's right and so obviously when i was there at ceo uh, our main focus was commercializing the first one yeah. and creating a whole community of people around that bike because if you look at any other you know mountain biking when it first started it was just crazy guys in um in california just taking old um, bikes from the road and just going downhill on them and then innovating and innovating. And that community was what founded the whole sport behind mountain biking. So with Manta 5, they were really trying to create that whole community, which then with competition creates a sport. Yeah. Once you've got a sport, then you can start to really innovate on different um you know, experiences within that sport. So obviously like riding waves or going really high speed, um, you know, slalom and those types of things were kind of what we were working on as next stages for Manta 5. Yeah. So when did you start showing it off to people? Um, like when, well, yeah. obviously, because I imagine family and friends would have been first, uh, would they? Before yeah. you started showing it on a grand scale i know you went to the consumer electronics show that's right yeah. yeah so we we got really lucky with promotion so we were private r d facility for like five and a half years keeping it top secret not really telling too many people how do you do that <laughs> it's painful. especially in this day and age with social media and <laughs> everything is recorded that's it that's yeah. it and we had to be really careful because even at Waterworld, would have people trying to take videos when they were just swimming laps um you know they're like oh what's this and oh. we had to have signs up like don't take photos and videos and we had to have people watch watching to see that they weren't. Um, but then we did one, we wanted to get it public, right? So um, we entered into a design award in New Zealand um, called the Best Awards. Yeah. We ended up making a video for that and it got on the news and then I got, got on Facebook and we got 350 million views on that one video. It just went viral. Like every, all the bigger media channels in the world picked it up. So we went from like this private R&D company to like on the global stage just within like five days that's insane that must have caught you completely off guard massively we i mean we would have been stoked with half a million views <laughs> yeah you know? yeah yeah so, 350 million views that's it and so now as a result of that all the media knows that by picking up on the story with manta 5 they're going to get views so um, yeah. we've been featured on like you know bbc and the associated press and um yeah just heaps of really cool um digital trends and stuff in the u.s so um, yeah, it's been so. Cool. Did you get a, like a lot of people wanting to invest in the product and um, 
Yeah. All that jazz. Yeah, there's been a few really cool investors that got involved in New Zealand, but then also quite a few international investors who have expressed interest. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, we even had like Baron Davis, who's like, you know, NBA all-star who yeah. wanted to invest in it. So I had a meeting with him in Hollywood and stuff. So, yeah, it definitely caught the attention and the imagination of a lot of people. Because I imagine there's a before and after that 350 million views. Oh, yeah. 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 It, it completely changed. It went from like... You know what is this nutty project that we're working on to wow this might have some legs you know yeah and then investors really starting to see the potential and um you know the commercialization because it's a cool product there's no doubt like when we would be at any show there'd be a crowd around us like you couldn't even get past our stand mm. because it's just crazy product right and then you're like yeah. you've got all these questions how does it work and could i write it and those types of things but then to be an investor you're like okay well that's all good and well but how many people are going to buy it right so when you start getting 350 million views on something you start to think okay there's there's a market here so yeah that's when it started to all um you know accelerate i guess was there any self-doubt in the beginning though because i i can imagine i mean i'm a creative person myself and there's there's always that part of you that doubts yourself so I'm yep. wondering if you guys ever had that in the beginning. I'm sure you didn't up to the 350 million views, but <laughs> oh, there's still initially... doubt. there's always doubt. Yeah, and, and, um, yeah. I mean, entrepreneurial game is hard, eh? Like that's yeah. the one thing is like um, there's always doubt and fear because um, you're you're you it's know, a risk. It's, yeah, major. I think I probably had more doubt than our founder. Our founder is a very visionary guy, and he backs himself um, to be you know to be able to make things happen. Um, and I think that inspired me a lot to be able to keep pushing mm. um and he had the money to invest himself so he was fully behind it 100 percent um which helped a lot but um yeah there's always doubt man whenever you, <laughs> even even once we got the 350 yeah. we're like can we build this thing you know can we keep it waterproof can we deliver what the customer thinks they're going to get you know yeah. like um can we build a team in new zealand or even in hamilton to be able to make it happen can we get the investment we need there's there's a whole bunch of you know questions that you face each day which obviously um yeah create fear um, so so with the after the the 350 million views was there any part of you that went back to the drawing board or were you uh looking at other ways to make sh ensure or double checking everything more um going over everything more thorough i suppose yeah well the irony of that is that though that 350 million views was me and one of our engineers on prototype bikes we had we had no um you know solidified supply chain of how we're going to produce it and then we thought oh you know if we get half a million that'll be cool then we can start to look at commercializing all this and we got 350 million views or like hundreds of thousands of people onto our website requesting interest to be able to purchase and we didn't have our supply chain ready to even manufacture and we actually completely changed the entire bike new motor new new frame new buoyancy modules everything changed from that that video until we're now actually able to deliver bikes so the team delivered um, to our customers in New Zealand over summer, yeah. and then they're I think they're weeks away now from delivering to, um, you know, I think it's about three hundred customers internationally on the first shipment. So, Pretty yeah, because you guys sold out like straight away, didn't you? Yeah, on the first order. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, I imagine because um, this probably would have happened. Because when did you resign? Oh, so I stepped down from my role about eight, nine weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. So kind of during the whole COVID-19 thing. Yeah. It was yeah. actually real challenging, eh? Because um, I knew for a while, um, but I was just kind of uh, managing the transition with the new CEO coming in, who is our ops manager. Yeah, fair enough. Um, pretty talented dude. And um, yeah, so then I actually let the team know on a um, Google Hangout in, COVID, in level four lockdown oh true so it's a pretty hard way to tell your team that you're you're stepping down yeah yeah um so yeah yeah but because how was that i mean because obviously you were ceo at the time when COVID 19 was really becoming a major thing mm -hmm. on a global scale because this would have been in march yeah 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 so had you already decided before COVID 19 Oh, so um, I came back from Mexico. Um, I was on a resort, uh, like a retreat over there. Yeah. And just had some really good heart-to-heart -heart conversations with our founder guy. Yeah. Um, and then um, the board had decided that it was time for me to stand down and allow um, someone else to take it through to that next stage. And yeah. I knew it was coming at some point, mm. um, probably not as early as when it did, but, um, you know, that was all part of it. And so then we, we just went through the whole process of how I was going to transition out. And, um, and then level four lockdown started. Well, I could start 
to see it coming. So trying to prepare my whole team to be able to get, you know, working from home, we got 30 staff, you know, what was, you know, what was the funding strategy going to be around it and all that stuff. And then also to be transitioning out was a pretty, pretty tough time. And I think it also played in um, pretty tough for our team as well, you know, to, yeah. to have all of this uncertainty and then for the, for the CEO to, to be stepping down. But um, we got a really good operations manager who stepped in as CEO and he's a pretty talented uh, operator. So I think that kind of steadied the ship a bit. Um, but mm. yeah, it was a, it was an interesting time man. it's been an interesting last seven, eight weeks. Yeah. But you're doing okay. Yeah. Like you cope during lockdown. Yeah. It was actually, um, it was a forced break you know like I've, I've spent over four years um as a ceo and it's an intense role with that many staff oh, and all imagine. that stuff so taking that forced holiday um just allowed me to sort of step back and un unwind a bit yeah. um, you don't realize how stressed you are until you actually stop um <laughs> so well yeah, yeah. i suppose that's one of the good things about COVID 19 eh? it gets um well it gives people the time to reflect somewhat that's it yeah i mean a lot of people have done it quite hard with COVID, obviously with the financial yeah. struggles and um you know business struggles and stuff like that but i guess i'm pretty privileged in the position that i am to be able to have that time to reflect and see what what's next for me so yeah because I was doing a bit of research on you, obviously, you know, research, Facebook stalking, whatever. <laughs> um, but like you've, you, it seems like a pretty sweet role that you had, man. Like you got to travel around the world. I mean, where have you been? China, America, Fiji, like promoting this thing. That's it. Yeah. 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 Um, I've been so fortunate today that it's been, because it's just such a cool product, you get opportunities to be able to talk to heaps of different people in New Zealand. And yeah. we went to the GoPro Summit in um, Broome, which is amazing. Um, got to go to the US quite a few times, um, to China a lot, Taiwan for our manufacturers. Um, yeah, met some amazing people. Did you get to explore while you were there or was it mainly focused solely on the, the Manta 5? <clears throat> some of our trips are pretty intense, like yeah. your, your back-to-back meetings and all yeah. that stuff. Mm. Um, but one of the coolest trips, I, I went with my marketing manager, Louie, and we went um, all through the United States just literally um, seeking out you know different locations, talking to people. And so we just went on like a road trip for three weeks all through the States, down the whole coast from San, um, San Francisco down to San Diego, across all through Florida and stuff like that so that was a pretty rad trip um just meeting people and um checking out cool spots and was that last year um a couple of years ago okay. just just as we were forming the ideas around marketing yeah because the u.s is such a massive place oh, we yeah, knew it's huge. It was, yeah we knew it was going to be one of our key markets so we, we got over there just to be able to actually see it and meet with people so but yeah i got to meet like tim brown the founder of Allbirds, and yeah. like um you know get to trip around, see all these people, um, got to meet the the chief marketing officer from GoPro um, down near San Diego. So it was just like, it was a rad trip. You could probably easily find work anywhere now, I'd imagine. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because yeah, I've been reflecting a lot on this and it's like, you get it's a pretty privileged position to be in, in a startup like that, well-funded mm. and the knowledge that I've gained over four years has been pretty incredible and so now i'm just like you know what's the next things for me i really want to try and share some of the knowledge that i've learned um through this because i was like reflecting on it like for me i, I kind of look at it like what is privilege and i look at it as like it's knowledge that you gain right mm. and then it's the connections that you can gain and then from the connections like what opportunities do you have and then what support can you be put can be put around you and for me i've gone from being a truck driver before i went to uni to gaining some knowledge, um, getting connected with Guy, him giving me an opportunity as one of the youngest CEOs to be able to have a have a crack at this, and then the support that I was that was around me to be able to make it work. So, I've been super privileged, and now how can I kind of you know disseminate some knowledge that I might might have gained to other people to to be on that path as well? Because I imagine not just with business, but I think in life, like it's not necessarily what you know, but who you know as well. Majorly. Yeah. Majorly. Yeah. Would and, that be like your number one piece of advice to like entrepreneurs and business people? Um, yeah. And it's interesting because it's it's not fixed either. Like people think, oh, I don't have the connections, so I can't do it. But you can actually gain connections quite quite quickly. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to have opportunities which, um, you know, present themselves, but you can form your own luck a little bit. So, I mean, working with Guy and obviously on such a 
radical product. I got to ha- um, call up people and ask for meetings. So, you know, I'd ca- I called up Peter Beck from Rocket Lab, the founder of Rocket Lab. And, oh, nice. What's you know, he like? Oh, he's incredible. Yeah. Absolute visionary beyond any entrepreneur that I've seen in New Zealand. Yeah. And, you know, going to the Rocket Lab uh, headquarters and sitting over top of the um, where they're making all the rockets and having meetings with him, you know, those sort of connections that you can build um, allow you to sort of think differently. He's a massive sort of international thinker. And he, the one thing he was looking at is like, how can you 10x what you're thinking right now? How can you do 10 times more, 10 times bigger? Um, and just those sort of inspiring talks that you have with people, um, I, think I think it changes the game. I think I watched one interview with him where I think he mentioned that, you know, um, Kiwis need to think more broadly. We think, you know, too local sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Instead of global. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the other things I've been reflecting a lot of a lot on since leaving Manta Five is just w- what's next for New Zealand and what can I do to support some of that? Because I, f- I feel like we hamstring ourselves a lot in New Zealand around startups. Um, a lot of very very talented entrepreneurs don't really get the support or the funding in the style that's needed to be able to make them globally successful. Why do you think that is? Oh, uh, I think it's there's a multitude of things really. I think one is um, the education around what what it means to be super successful internationally. Mm. Um, two is around the structure of investment in New Zealand. We just one is we just don't have enough cash mm. from investors choosing to invest in startups. Um, and then the other one is just the valuations that people put on on companies. Because for example, like with a founder, if you were to take money from, say you gave me money and I gave you say 40% of my company, and then I had another round of funding and gave away another 40% of my company or 30%, and I then go to Silicon Valley to try and raise large amounts of money, once I've proven the concept, they won't invest in you because you simply don't have enough skin in the game at that point. And so a lot of oh. New Zealand entrepreneurs give away, and and rightly so because they can't get funding otherwise, they give away too much of their of their company over those first few rounds of funding. And then it means that they're uninvestable for the larger investors that they need to be able to then take it global. Um, so with Peter Beck, for example, he knew he needed, from day one, he needed hundreds of millions of dollars, which is why he then raised money in, in Silicon Valley with Series A round investors and flipped to being a US company. A lot of people give him grief for being a US company. Yeah, and it's like, oh, come on, man. Well, it's it's interesting because, it, I mean, a lot of money's coming back into New Zealand for um, Rocket Lab, but... Um, people just don't understand that the construct of New Zealand investment doesn't fit companies like Rocket Lab. And so, I don't know, I think there's a there's a number of things that can change in New Zealand. I think there's a big uh, education piece and push for people to buy housing. So if you have a bit of money, buy your first house. If you've got a bit more money, then invest in an investment property. People know it. It's like a cookie cutter approach to being able to you know, yeah, it's the number wealth. one way of people investing residential property. That's right. When and there's it, a lot of other ways. Yeah. yeah, and there's also a lot of um, incentive to be able to invest in property over business. Yeah. Um, you know, the tax side of things is heavily weighted towards being, um, to, you know, a, a advantage to being able to invest in property and stuff. So mm. I don't know. I think there's some stuff there that can change. But uh, I think the main thing is just around educating entrepreneurs in New Zealand to really understand uh, how they can make it work in New Zealand because it's a brilliant place to actually launch a company. It's one of the easiest places yeah, in the world. Yeah, I heard it was number one in terms of starting a business. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely right up there for the, for a lot of different reasons. And then the other thing I think which is advantageous to New Zealand is you can call up anybody in New Zealand and more often than not they'll say yes to giving you a hand, which is crazy. Like in America, you cannot talk to those those sort of people. Like, you know, they've got all the people in front of them to try and you know, stop that happening. Whereas to give Peter Beck a phone call and within like a minute him being like, yeah, I'll meet with you. It's just unheard of in oh, most countries. Is that, is that what you did? You yeah. just called him up and- Cold called him, yeah. Did he know who you were or Not made at it five all. No. Oh, I think he might've seen a video, Okay, which was helpful. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> what well, makes it easier to picture that? <laughs> yeah. That's it. So oh, I don't know. I think I think we're really privileged in New Zealand and we've got, a, we've got some wicked people around startups to be able to help them. But I just think, you know, some acceleration into that area, I think, I believe will be the future of New Zealand because, um, you know, farming and all that stuff is good, like providing for the world. Um, you know, we've got um, a whole bunch of tourism, which is obviously on the rocks. Well, which is why I think we need to diversify. That's it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What's so, your What's your thoughts on the uh, 
you know, the, the term of the Waikato being the Silicon Valley of New Zealand? Um, I think anyone who thinks that needs to go to Silicon Valley. And as you <laughs> said, <laughs> um, no, I, I think there's potential in New Zealand. I, and I don't necessarily think it's just like one hub, Auckland or, you know, Tauranga or whatever. I think in order to be able to compete on the world stage, I think we need to have, um, you know, Silicon Valley, just the population in Silicon Valley alone is the whole whole of New Zealand. So I think we need to have more of a united front across the country, which is what the likes of Callaghan Innovation and NZTE and stuff are doing, and they're fantastic at it. Yeah, It's just, yeah, just more collaboration, more knowledge sharing, um, guiding entrepreneurs to make the right decisions because there's some smart people here with some wicked ideas. Oh, yeah, there are. Mm. I think sometimes, um, you know, they just don't get enough exposure or they don't get the platform to really get, you know, what they need to across. That's it. And particularly in New Zealand because it's it's like a village in some senses. So it is really who you know. That's it. Yeah, yeah. That's it. And when I come back to the whole privilege thing, like how do we how do we make sure that everyone or any, anyone who has a great idea isn't um, you know left wondering about could I have made that idea successful? Like how do we give the knowledge to people? How do we sh- show them and give them connections with the right people? And then how do you give them opportunities to give it a crack? And then put the support mechanisms mechanisms around them because you do those four things with some smart entrepreneurs or anybody in life that that doesn't I mean for music in the music industry right. You, you know all about it. You you give people the knowledge about how to make great music. You give them connections with the right, you know, um, producers and the record labels. Um, you give them that crack to have a go. And then you put the support mechanism around it when they start falling off the bandwagon. Um, yeah, well, that's, that's <laughs> right. Well, you know, when you get that big, I think sometimes your ego can that's it. almost lead to self-sabotage. Yeah, and yeah. it can. Yeah. And, and how, so, how did you avoid that, actually? Because I imagine, I mean, if I was in your position, you know, CEO of this massive company, 350 million views, you know, this product's like going rapidly off the shelves and stuff. I I could see myself developing a bit of, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say cockiness, but, you know, almost into yourself too much and develop like a bit of a, a bit of an ego. Or do you mm. just, have you always been able to remain grounded? Oh, I, yeah, there's ego parts that play into it for sure. Yeah. Um, and being grounded is pretty challenging when you're, um, you know, you've got that many things you're trying to manage. Um, I guess probably the fear of <laughs> get me grounded. No, it's like we were burning a lot of money um, and we're seemingly big on Facebook and those types of things, but we do have a relatively small team and a lot of different priorities to be able to get done. So yeah. I think just the sheer um, amount of work that needed to be done kind of keeps you grounded and then I had I had some really good support and mentors around me as well um like I found a guy guy so what's yeah. like the number one thing you think you learned from guy well, like, like, how is he different things <laughs> like because obviously as an entrepreneur what what do you think is the thing that separates him from everyone else I think I think there's two things I think one is that he backs himself has full confidence in his own ability to be able to make something happen. Right. Um, and he, he dreams it up and just believes in his dream. That's one thing. Um, but then I think the um, he doesn't allow problems to um, consume him. So he stays quite light on some of the detail and allows other people to do that stuff so that he doesn't drown in detail and he just allows himself to stay at that level. I, I think that... Um, you know, I'd come to him, right? And we'd just put 100 grand into making a new prototype and it didn't work at all. You know, we put it in the pool and it just failed. And you go to him and be like, oh, we, you know, this it just didn't work. And he's like, okay, what are we doing next? You know, if I had put 100 grand into something and then it just didn't work at all, I'd be sitting there like, oh, what am I going to do about it? Like, how am I going to, you know? Yeah. But yeah. he's just like, what's next? You know, he's just constantly on the, on the um, path towards his dream. And I think that... Self-assurance, I think, is a big part of what I've learned from him. But then all, like, he, he's a big storyteller and a really big yarner, and he's really good at negotiation and, and getting people on board with his vision and stuff. So I learned a lot about that stuff as well yeah. through, through him. I bet you did. Yeah. Because um, obviously this has been taken up by a wide uh, bunch of people. But, I mean, because quite a few celebrities have, bought into these things as well yeah 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 i mean you met Shaq, 
<laughs> what was that like meeting him? <laughs> that was pretty cool. Actually, we were um, at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Yeah, and we had this crowd of people around our stand, and then this massive dude walks in, and I'm like man that guy's tall and then he comes closer i was like is that Shaq?" Oh, yeah and because he's like over seven foot he could just see over the crowd and yeah. saw the bike and was like that's interesting so he came up and talked to me and he's like man do you think i could ride one of these and i'm like well i'm about 220 pounds he's like i'm, <laughs> I'm 350 and i was just like nah, i don't know that this model would be the right one for you he's like man that's a rad product and then uh, i quickly got a photo with him and stuff before yeah, yeah. i left but um he was just promoting something as he was walking through the the show but yeah like it's, it's nuts, eh? Just to see the um, the people that are in that space, like you know, um, what what do we have? Some uh, magician who came um, through, um, but just meeting like Baron oh, Davis and all those sort of guys. Yeah, yeah. David Copperfield. David Copperfield. <laughs> he rocked through. Yeah, and just was interested. That's but then, so buzzy. But we ended up um, getting a lady, and she's like, "Man, my friend would love one of these." And we're like, "Oh, that's cool." And who's that? And he's like, "Oh, Richard Branson." And it's like, so then they got in <laughs> touch with Richard Branson, and then um, their their um, procurement team for Necker Island um, has been in touch. I think they've bought one of the bikes for him for Christmas, uh, for his birthday actually. That's nice. So it's just like, yeah, it's like a pinch me moment. Like, yeah, this is weird. This is surreal, and it's bizarre as well because in an interview like t- two years before he actually um, they bought one for him. Um, someone asked me like who who would if there was one person in the world you'd want to buy and ride the bike who would it be and I was like Richard Branson and then you know two years later yeah but you didn't get to, you haven't gone to meet Richard right? <laughs> no. unfortunately no no, no. Oh, no that's unfortunate because obviously at the CES like there'd be so many other innovative products there as well yep um, did you manage to get around and, and look at everything or were you just so focused on Manta Five that yeah, it's a, a massive show. Like yeah, it's the yeah. biggest consumer electronics show in the world. So there's like just diff- heaps of different buildings all through Vegas um, that yeah. host it. Um, but yeah, Google and um, Mercedes Benz launched their new car and a whole bunch of stuff like that. Um, but yeah, we were pretty focused on the stand that we had at the CES. And also, mm. we were doing people riding days out at um, Lake Las Vegas. Um, so oh, we nice. got like BBC and um, Associated Press and stuff to come out and actually ride the bike, which yeah. was cool. Um, but yeah, got to check out a few different things. Because I've, from what I've seen, is it pretty much got universally good reviews. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really interesting actually because at CES, like biggest consumer electronics show in the world, yeah. We because we got a couple of like the Associated Press and BBC in the f- before the show even started on the first day on Google, we were trending number one topic of the whole show, the biggest show in the world, and it was just like from there on, we just got so many interviews and like crowds of people around our stand and stuff. So yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. It's always cool to hear these type of stories, like these little underdog, you know, like the small little team that started off in Cambridge <laughs> and you're up on the world stage, number one, trending on Google. Yeah. 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 It was a it was a crazy ride. Yeah. And just being around some of these the people that we had in our team as well. Yeah. Were, it was pretty cool. Like I, I didn't know anything about or very little about manufacturing, um, engineering, you know, any of that stuff. And mm. sitting with some amazing, amazing talent. Just, you know, you'd dream up something and they'd be like, Yeah, I know what you're talking about. And two weeks later it'd be prototyped and on the bike and it's just like it was so cool. That must be motivating. Yeah. And it must create a drive, I suppose, when you see all these other people that are very smart. Well, I found for myself, every time I meet someone very intelligent, I get motivated by it yep. and more driven by it. 100%. So, and I suppose it is that with um, the entire team as well. Like you all motivate each other and you all um, give and take with each other. That's it. Yeah. And it was really cool actually, like, because, you know, you connect with these other entrepreneurs in New Zealand and it kind of normalizes the crazy. You know what I mean? Like you feel like you're way out of your depth often as an entrepreneur yeah. and just meeting other entrepreneurs and understanding that they felt like that as well, I think is pretty empowering. Yeah, know? yeah. Because you don't know what you don't know. And the only yeah, way, totally. The only way to suss it out is to, to give it a go and, and get um, advisors and stuff around you to figure it out. Like I knew nothing about IP, uh, intellectual property. I knew nothing about, you know, uh, I knew a little bit about IP, but, you know, I didn't know anything about manufacturing or suppliers or anything like that when I first started. So it's just um, just a journey where you actually connect with people and learn as you go. Mm. Do you know what you want to do now? Do you have an idea? Yeah. Well, there's a few things on my plate at the moment. Um, just coming back to that whole privilege thing, yeah. Um, I I've just been reflecting on like how can I support other people to gain that knowledge, connections, um, you know, and the opportunities. And so 
really in, in all walks of life so one of the things i'm involved in with um seed wakato is around helping people to um you know personally in their own life be inner leaders and then have opportunities to be of service to others so i'm kind of working with Gemma, who you've had on the show yeah in that space as one of the board members and then um really just around helping other entrepreneurs so i've got a little um consulting company that i've set up to be able to support other entrepreneurs um so that's venture val which is just around validating different ventures that people have okay um and then yeah i've got a few other opportunities that i'm just validating at the moment um, do you think you, do you think you'll stay in new zealand or go overseas well i suppose it's difficult at the moment because <laughs> of COVID 19 but yeah. um if that was not in the picture if we weren't in the middle of it you know a pandemic <laughs> um <laughs> would you would you stay here or would you look overseas or unsure um well the first thing i, I told myself i would do after leaving Manta five was to go traveling so that that's out of the <laughs> that's off the cards yeah. for a little while um i love new zealand i, I, I want to stay and live here in new zealand i'm not sure if it'll be hamilton but i, I do love it here um but yeah i definitely want to travel as well i think it helps you to just get a bit more culture day eh? like when you go to different Definitely. countries i think it's so important mm. and you mature as a person agreed you actually realize how ignorant you are about a lot of stuff too yeah 100 percent. and um i think it teaches you to be a bit more objective it's very easy i think to get caught up in your little bubble your little circle and develop like a you know like tunnel vision you just have one way of looking at things um so i like traveling when you do when you have traveled have you managed it? Because you know how, like, when some people travel, they just do it for the whole Instagram <laughs> picture thing so they can take pictures with just all the best touristy stuff. But did did you ever get to spend time with uh, a lot of the people there and just learn a bit about the culture and the day-to-day -day things? Or are you so caught up with the Manta 5 stuff that you don't really get the chance to? Yeah, so I did a bit of travel with Manta 5, and as I say, like, most of the time it was pretty, um, you know, we are on the on the job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then for university, I got to travel quite a bit um, f to different countries like um, Cambodia and India and stuff like that through uni. And that was very much kind of on business, kind of you how, didn't have a lot of time. But How long were you there for usually when you're overseas? Um, for India, it was like a prime minister's scholarship to study over there. So we studied for like three weeks at, um, in Delhi and got to travel a bit and yeah. stuff, which is how did, great. How did you find that? Because I've been to India. It's nuts, eh? Yeah, it's it's. There is nothing the same between New Zealand and India. <laughs> yeah. It's it was. I think if I hadn't watched documentaries and you know seen all of it on television and stuff, I think it probably would have been very overwhelming for me. Yeah. But I had a a fair idea. Like my partner's Indian, so okay. I at least you know she kind of helped me settle into things, and I was staying with family, and that's what I mean by the whole culture aspect because it teaches you how to live day to day there. That's yeah, it. Yeah. But and that's the one thing I really want to do is like, you know, do this one way ticket thing, you know, just go for a couple of months and just, or, you know, whatever it might be, but just live in that culture and just look, look at the day to day learnings of, uh, or like the day to day living and learn from how that culture actually does life, you know? Yeah. Um, whereabouts in India did you go? Um, so we were in Baroda. Okay. Which, uh, or Vododora, as it's because you know how they have two names. Um, but we did spend a bit of time in Mumbai. Oh yeah. Like I came back and I was thinking, you know what? I'm not going to complain about Auckland traffic anymore because Mumbai is just insane. But I found my way. I found that I've been slipping back into my old ways and complaining about Auckland traffic, <laughs> even though on a world scale it's actually not that bad. Uh, but yeah, so those those were the two main places. Obviously, we were planning to go back this year, but. COVID-19 so yeah that's not happening but yeah it's it's a very very enlightening experience yeah. I, I think it was definitely a before and after um after I went there right yeah and just also like the privilege the have and the have nots is so different eh? like the polar opposites between the rich and the very very poor yeah I mean it was weird I we went because my um, partner knows quite a um, quite a few people like more in the lower class and the upper class you know we we'd spend one you know one day in a slum and the next we're in like this 11 million dollar apartment and particularly in Mumbai we were in this uh you know this this flash as apartment where um they owned all all the floors pretty much wealthy as but it overlooks like this massive slum it was just weird because i never i never got used to it no but they just it's the norm 
to them. Yeah. Know? And it's just, it's, it's so easy to take stuff for granted, you know, just the air that we breathe here, you know, for example, um, you know, and uh, I was pretty, um, hard for me to sometimes see like little kids, you know, very, very skinny, you know, with no food. Yeah. And you're just like, man, and here I am complaining that food is, you know, so expensive here. It's, it's, yeah, so it's it's really, really good. I mean, I, I try to encourage everyone I can to at least go traveling. And when I say traveling, I don't mean go to Australia, you know, because it's, <laughs> it's Australia is similar to New Zealand in a lot of ways, you know. Um, so to, to go to some of those Asian countries or somewhere in the Middle East or somewhere that's just very different to mm -hmm. New Zealand, polar opposite. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so that might be on the cards. Yeah, yeah. So I Would there be a particular country you'd want to do it? Man, I'd love to go uh, lots of different places. Southeast Asia, um, South yeah. America would mm. be cool. Um, I got to go to Mexico um, a couple months ago, what, four or five months ago, which was cool. How was that? It was amazing. Yeah. Tulum in Mexico is one of the most beautiful places, like just quite a spiritual kind of place. It's real. It's mm. hard to describe. But Are um, you a spiritual person? Or? Um, yeah, I'd say I'm uh, I'm getting a little bit more spiritual in my older age. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just kind of, I mean, I, I was there for, I don't know if you know Aubrey Marcus. He's a, he does a whole bunch of podcasts and he owns On It with um, Joe Rogan. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so he um, he started this whole mastermind, he calls it, um, which is called Fit for Service. So yep. I was there for like a retreat. There's just some amazing minds there, like some, um, you know, it's just all about like kind of inner leadership, understanding your own, you know, physical, mental, um, spiritual well-being. Mm. Uh, and then being in Tulum as well. Um, just kind of topped it off. So, yeah, I came back buzzing from that. Yeah, it, it, it really does change you. Mm. Um, yeah, so, I mean, with you could go to Taiwan <laughs> if we yeah. do open up. I don't know what's happening with this trans-Tasman bubble and, and, you know, Taiwan doesn't have many cases, so that could be another option as well. That's a rad place. Have you been to Taiwan? No, but I do want to go. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of places I want to go. And then for whatever reason, I don't end up going or something comes up or, you know. And I don't really like flying. Okay. Like, <laughs> I like everything except the actual flying. I can probably do about three to five hours and then I'm f I'm, I'm okay. But once it gets over the five-hour mark, I'm like, I'm over this. Yeah. Like, being stuck in one chair for, like, five hours. But the problem is in New Zealand, it takes ages to fly anywhere that's not Australia. So, that's it's, it. just, it's just the way it is. Sleeping pills. It's the only answer. <laughs> Sleeping pills? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is definitely. that what you is that what you did? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Have... Yeah, because I'd imagine the um time difference as well when you're traveling to all these different places. It would mess with mess you up, I'm sure. That's it, yeah. Trying to yeah, you gotta try and time it right so that you sleep in their evening time the first day you get there. And if you do yeah. that, then I think you're you're well on the way to getting over the jet lag. I've been to uh the UK a couple of times. Oh, that's a nightmare to try and get there. <laughs> yeah, well, you pretty much can't fly any further than that. Yeah. And there's an exact 12-hour time difference. Right. So, you know, it's like 10 a.m. in the morning and you're like, you know, you just want to sleep and you have to try and stay awake so your body clock can adjust. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because are you a vegetarian? Is Are you a vegetarian or vegan? Yeah, the vegetarian, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I've, um, I try and eat a little bit less dairy and stuff like that just because it doesn't agree with me. But, but yeah, I've been vegetarian for like maybe five, six years. What so. was the reason to, for the transition? Um, I mean, personally, it's just around more around the environmental side of things. Right. Like I was just looking at, you know, the um, how to decrease my own, um, you know, um, environmental impact. And obviously, like... There's some things like driving a car if you can't afford an electric car or, you, you know, you have to go flying or something that's pretty hard to avoid. But I just thought, well, you know, if I can reduce my carbon emissions through um, eating less uh, meat and dairy. Um, so I managed to cut out um, eating meat and, yeah, just slowly weaning off the, the dairy. <laughs> it it's it, pretty hard. It is, yeah. It is pretty hard. I um, So I've, I've recently had like... Uh, almost like a gut inflammation. Yep. You know, I was having bloating problems, um, you know, constipation. I actually had hemorrhoids at one point. Oh, very, wow. very bad. Um, and I actually got a hair test done at, a, at the herbal clinic mm -hmm. in Melville and stuff. Found out, you know, I was allergic to gluten, dairy, sugar, nightshade, pretty much everything. But there's like a level in terms of how, how much um, 
how bad the allergies are. That's right. Right. So like uh, for the last month, I've pretty much had to change my diet quite dramatically. I think sugar was the hardest one to get rid of because it's in everything. Yeah. But like I lost like 10 kgs in one month just from cutting out sugar. Wow. But like I've I've changed my diet quite dramatically and I've also cut down dramatically on meat. Okay. Um, my partner's a vegetarian as well. So right. like she cooks all these vegetarian meals. But and you just notice the change. Meals. <laughs> oh yeah, man. Yeah. It's the best thing about being with an Indian is all the all the Indian meals. Um but I noticed a huge change just within a month. Like did you find you had um more energy? Yeah, I just feel lighter. Yeah, you do feel lighter, right? Yeah. Not as heavy. Mm. Yeah. Cause meat it can be quite heavy, particularly stuff like steak. That's you know? it. Yeah, And it's very, I mean, I know there's like a lot of activists out there that are trying to, oh, New Zealand needs to go vegetarian. Yeah, But I, I always say to people, I'm like, that's a very, very hard thing to do because it's almost like embedded in the DNA of the country. And that's culture of the world over as well. Meat, yeah. meat is, is a major part of people's diets all over the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's very, particularly the Western world. Massively. Yeah. And I mean, I've always said that like trying to get, kiwis to give up meat is like trying to convince americans to give up guns it's it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah good luck yeah, yeah yeah it's just very very hard i did uh, i did see like james cameron was trying to develop some more vegan and vegetarian type um meals or plant based plant-based foods I, yeah 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 totally there's quite a bit of investment into it like some of the like beyond meat patties i don't know if you've tried them i don't know they're, they're that healthy for you but they're pretty delicious they're like um uh, probably have to check the packaging yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 but they're um they're just like a meat alternative there's heaps of them that are coming out they're actually pretty tasty yeah, but yeah yeah but in terms of like dairy and gluten like you mentioned like you know you talk to luke taylor one of my friends who's like you know big on health and nutrition he owns um, taylor performance and health and um He's like everyone is gluten intolerant and everyone is to a varying degree like dairy intolerant. Um, and so by cutting out a lot of the stuff and reducing inflammation in your body, it allows you to actually like your body to heal itself. You know, you'll have yeah. so, like you talked about inflammation. Once you start to diminish um, or reduce the inflammation in your body, it's amazing what your body will do itself to heal. So a lot of people like your other allergies will be diminished as well by just simply having less yeah. um, inflammation in your body. And I don't think it's covered that much in media, no. you know? Um, and I think a lot about food and how it's tied to your mood because I was finding I was getting like angry about stupid stuff or just, you know, a bit of a roller coaster in terms of emotions. And I'm like, why the hell am I like this? You know, but um, by cutting out certain foods, like, you know, my mental health was a lot better as well. I do wonder if, if New Zealand's mental health problem might somewhat be tied to what we eat. I think, um, I think it's a big factor for sure. Yeah. I mean, I know like food's very, very expensive in New Zealand, particularly if you want to eat healthy. That's it. And I think that's why people eat a lot of fast food and junk food and stuff because it's cheap, um, which, you know, can inevitably cause you to have health problems, which can probably affect your mood, which leads to other things I'm, i do wonder if like you know domestic violence and stuff might be tied in some way to that yeah um do you do you have um do you have like a lot of conversations with like, friends that still eat meat and stuff though um yeah yeah there's there's a lot of i mean because you know how some people are just you're not stopping me eating meat and i think there's 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 bad banter on both sides and, and yeah. you know standing in front of a meat section with signs trying to block people from getting it i don't think helps no <laughs> not at all yeah yeah no. um but in terms of the conversations you have with people are people you know when when people are, well when you're eating a vegetarian meal and people ask you that's the classic is when you're at the dinner table someone's like oh are you vegetarian why are you vegetarian well they've got like a steak on their plate <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like, yeah do i really want to be having this conversation right now and then i suppose you have to spend like 15 minutes trying to explain it <laughs> and then they don't want to hear it either anyway because yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't want to change it's like a rhetorical question <laughs> they're asking you but like they're not really interested you no, know no it's more a statement than a question. <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 it's just their face yeah like why are you yeah um no i think from a nutritional point of view it's a, it is more challenging to try and get so if you talk to like you know fitness and health people that mm. <clears throat> it's a lot easier to get the nutrition that you need um from meat and it's a lot more common like you just chicken breast or, or steak or whatever um <clears throat> but yeah i don't know it's um there's always alternatives for that same nutrition it's just getting a bit um more creative because it you know i i feel um this wasn't much of a problem in india because no nah. You know, like you go to a restaurant and the entrees is like 30 items 
you know, and I'm not exaggerating. It, it, it is <laughs> insane, insanely ridiculous. And, um, you know, there's so many vegetarian options. Whereas here I find in New Zealand, you go to a restaurant, you know, there'll be like, I don't know what, seven, eight mains. Yep. And one, one. vegetarian option, That's which it. is just annoying. I mean, because my partner's vegetarian, you know, and she's just like, oh, I just don't even want to eat out, you know, because limited in options. I mean, I, and I'd like to do it too, but I'm just like, oh, oh, well, I'll just eat this, you know. Yeah. So what what do you do in terms of like your dieting, and how do you how do you manage, you know, like because do you do you go to restaurants much? And yeah, yeah. probably too much. Yeah, I need to save a bit of money now. <laughs> but um, no, I um. With the help of like Luke, my my friend and stuff, I, I've just adopted like fasting in the morning, um, so I don't have anything until probably midday. Is it um, intermittent fasting? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So effectively, it's just having lunch and dinner and trying to make those, um, you know, within eight hour period, mm. and then um, going to sleep. You're full at night, and then you wake up in the morning, and you actually don't need food in the morning uh, unless you can eat something that's really good for you in the morning. Eating cereal or any sugars or anything like that is like the worst thing you can do for your body in the morning because it sugar spikes you, right? Which is what you're talking about. Um, so I just fast in the morning. Um, might have a black coffee or whatever and then i just do a smoothie for lunch so just pack all the stuff in it that i was given by luke um and shout out to luke yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and then yeah just that gives me all the micronutrients and stuff and then i just do whatever for dinner i'm not that strict man like I'm, i still need to lose quite a bit of weight but um and oh get, you look good man <laughs> cheers yeah um just got to get back into fitness and stuff as yeah, well. yeah 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 have you done the Hakurumada track? Yeah, it's a killer. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to do that like once a week, eh? Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you're ever keen, man, let me know. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, because I think the first time I did it, I was like, man, this just goes on forever. Like the steps never end, eh? Yeah. But I think the more you do it, the, the better you get at it. Yeah, my sister used to do it a lot. Um, those those signs that you see up on the on the steps are actually in memory of my sister. So my sister passed oh, away really? like five or six years ago now. Um, and so those are like she used to do it for boxing training and stuff. So those signs just to help people get up. You know, that's a cool homage though. Yeah, it yeah. It, it, it was pretty cool. My yeah. mum kind of came up with the idea, and um, the Department of Conservation let us do it. So that was real cool. Oh, that's real good of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what what restaurants do you recommend as a vegetarian? Um, um, oh man, there's quite a few. I mean, Indian Thai places have the widest array of, yeah, of yeah. food, so they're totally. pretty good. Um, but pretty much anywhere has that one option, so it's just <laughs> looking at what that one option is. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, places like Gothenburg and stuff like that, they'll have um, you know all the different tapas that are all vegetarian. So I just like you basically just go down the you know if there's one <laughs> option or two options or whatever, you just pick that one. Like it's um, most people will have it now, and I think because it's more and more common that people are vegetarian though um restaurants and stuff will have to increase their options and be better in that market um in order to be able to get you know because if one person's vegetarian out of five that are going out for dinner yeah you got to make that one vegetarian happy otherwise they're not going to want to go there that's right that's why it's a nightmare <laughs> if you've got a whole group of people and they've all got different intolerances right? it's, just... <laughs> it's like the new age thing eh? it's like 20 questions of the person in the front of the house just ask has this got nut in it has this got gluten has this got yeah 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 Mm. So when when you were working um, at Mental Five, did you get much downtime at all? Did you ever get yeah any free time? Yeah, I got a little bit. Because um, what you, what do you do? Like, what's what's your go to thing when you're when you're not working um, besides traveling? Yeah, <laughs> I do. I do enjoy traveling, like from my own things. So like going to the beach or you know Raglan or whatever. Yeah. Um, I like taking. I like doing a bit of photography and stuff. So I got a oh, nice. and like a camera and stuff and do a bit of that. But um, have you got a drone? Nah, I want one though. You should get one. I've got one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's cool, cool to take pictures. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you can kind of set them on their own um, flights, so you could program it to like follow someone. Yeah, yeah, and get some cool video footage, or you can just program it to take a picture of, um, you know, a certain person. Or yeah, there's there's quite a lot of um, automated features you can do with it, where That's you just crazy, kind yeah. of set set it up, and then it does it for you. Yeah, not so much. You know, <laughs> trying to control it with the 
with the control the yeah. controller of the remote. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we had um we've had a couple of drones for Manta Five, uh, oh, but I've yeah. never had a crack at them, eh? Because we obviously to film on water, the best way to do it is with a drone. So yeah, yeah. But I think we lost like three drones or well, two <laughs> drones. We got the third drone. Um, one of them got run over by a car. The other one, I think, went into oh, a tree no. or something. So I know a lot of people that bought drones and then they crashed them yep. within a day. You know. <laughs> Yeah, it's like that Christmas present that yeah, doesn't yeah. even last a day. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose it depends on, you know, how, how good they are. But like, you know, if you're spending twelve hundred dollars or two thousand dollars on a drone and you break it, it's probably the worst thing ever. Painful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I saw that you um you're in Wellington for um Eminem's concert, eh? Oh yes. Because I you was have there. been stalking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. It was a rad concert, eh? Oh yeah, it was. Yeah. Um did you drive there or fly there? Oh, we flew there. Yeah. 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 It we was, drove. Oh, sheesh. Yeah, that was it was a nightmare, man, because yeah. it's just, I don't know, I think 20,000 people just drove into Wellington, so traffic was just a nightmare. I think as soon as we got to, like, Levin, traffic just got really, really bad. Yeah. It was, like, worse than Auckland. It oh, It was insane. Wow. I mean, the whole reason I moved out of Auckland was to avoid <laughs> stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, but what a concert, man. He just puts it on, eh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen him twice. I actually saw him at Western Springs yep. as well. Yeah, um, I saw him there too. Yeah. I got out straight after it finished though because oh, it was effort. just a nightmare because I'm not sure if you saw the, the buses and everything afterwards, but everyone just trying to converge yeah. on the exit and <laughs> just end up waiting like an hour just to get out. So I try to get out pretty quick. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, I might wrap up there unless there's anything else you want to cover. No, man. Yeah. It's been fun. Yeah, man. Cheers for having me yeah, on. Yeah, So, um, obviously, if anyone wants to follow any updates with Manta 5, what's the best way? Social media and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, Manta 5 is all over um, social media yeah. on Facebook and Instagram, uh, manta5.com. Uh, you can check out some of the videos on YouTube and stuff as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, and if if anyone's interested, they can get in touch with the team. We've got a pretty cool um, marketing and comms team. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there any job openings? In- <laughs> <laughs> Not at the moment, I don't think. I think they're pretty tight on who they hire. At the well, moment. they're both, yeah. <laughs> I, I imagine so, and I, I imagine a lot of people would be lining up the door just to um to come have a go. To, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because they're what thirteen thousand dollars for one. Yeah, so it's not the, really aimed at like probably the you know. The average Joe. Yeah. It's pretty it's, high market at, for now, but is Guy working on a, you know, is him and the team working on, you know, maybe making a smaller version or? Yeah, dulled down version. Yeah, um, more economy yeah. valued version. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you look at a lot of product strategy, often it's the more expensive model that um, you start with. Yeah, Because um, yeah, there's obviously all the technologies in it. Yeah. Um, but then as we as the team go further forward, they'll, they'll be releasing other products that are um, uh, sort of easier entry-level products and stuff as well. Um, but yeah, the price is actually... Um, being validated for the US and Europe. So the US and Europe, they pay a lot more for products. So I think of you'll course. find that um, the team will be discounting. Hev- we heavily discounted those first products for New Zealand Kiwis customers. Kiwis are pretty cheap. They're tight say. asses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are. We are. Yeah. So, yeah. But no, it's a, it's a hell of a lot of fun yeah. to have a go on one. If you get an opportunity, I'd definitely Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. Like if I wanted to try one out, what would be the best way of me going about it? Um, I think Do I just you, call you, up Guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, give him a call. <laughs> <laughs> He's got one in Paranoia if you go past his house. But um, no, I think the best way would just be to wait for one of the um, the demos that that will be happening over summer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Probably what, at Raglan, Lake Carapero? Oh, yeah. And all one of the beaches. Yeah, one of the beaches. Coromandel yeah. or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. Cool, man. Hey, well, thanks for this. Yeah. It's been cool. Cool chat. Uh, but yeah, if, if you guys want to follow all the updates on Manta 5, um, yeah. I'll leave all the the social media and all the website and all the information online. But yeah, otherwise, stay safe. Until next time. See you later.